Okay. So, um, Todd's Welfare Society is basically an animal rescue NGO. As mentioned, we started in 2016. Um, TWS came into being literally just out of nowhere. So, just like you, I was working. I was work. I started off working in Starcom. I don't know how many of you know about that. And I was working with Coca-Cola. I had no plans of starting an NGO or anything at all. I was running a blog. Uh, called For Earth, and uh, I used to talk about environmental rights, envi environmental policy, and things that we need to change in our daily lives, you know, because you have water scarcity and all those other issues. And then I happened upon a couple of um, societies which were working for animal rights, so I started talking about that as well, and I started volunteering with them. And that was my literally my first step into the animal rescue world as it is. And this was almost maybe eight, nine years ago. Um, right after that, I remember I was at work. This is 2016, and I got a call from my friend. His name is Umar. And he told me about this dog who was shot. Um, so she, her, we called her Joanne. We named her Joanne. And she was shot in her eyes twice. She was bleeding to death. We tried to find some NGO, somebody who could help her but there was literally nobody. And after trying for like an hour, I, I left my work, we went, we picked her up, we took her to uh, a vet, but then she was too far gone and we had to put her down. The very next day, TWS was started. And the idea behind it was that, you know, the time to talk about things, which I was doing on my blog, that it wasn't leading anywhere. So either we can talk about things or we can make things happen. And I realized it was time to make things happen. Just talking about it would not stop what was happening to the animals out there. Now, the first question that usually I am asked is why, why Todd? Why is Todd's Welfare Society called that? So, um, Todd is basically named after my own dog um, who went missing almost, I guess, 14 years ago now. Um, he walked out of the door and within five minutes I went after him and he was gone. Now, I looked for him for days and for weeks and we did not find him anywhere. And this was the time when I was in A-levels. And my finals were like, I guess a month away. I did horribly. I was so depressed. And people around me, they could not understand why that is so. My friends and my family, they would keep telling me, you know, I mean, it was just a dog. Jobs, okay, you know, get another one. It's not a big deal. It's just a dog. Why are you depressed? Why do you feel this way? So that moment, which was horrible for me, was funny for a lot of people. When I went out giving his pamphlets, distributing them, or when I asked even the police to put them up or something, it was funny for them. And that's when I realized how we look at animals. And it literally opened my eyes to how our society treats them. We look at them as products, just how, oh yeah, my, my bag has a scratch on it or your bag goes missing. So you go out there and you get a new one. We look at animals as non-feeling, non-thinking beings. We don't think that they have any rights at all. We don't think that they deserve any rights at all. Even though, you know, as per um, a study done by University of Cambridge, animals are sentient beings. Uh, which means that they can think and they can feel and they can respond to the environment around them. So just how you and I, we we'll feel sad about something, so would they. Just how we feel scared, we feel love, we feel happiness, so do they. But in our society, that's not something that we look at. Look at the way we're treating animals in zoos. Look at the way we're treating animals in, you know, the entertainment business. You've got circuses. Recently, um, there was a dolphin show over here. This was about a couple of years back before COVID started. And I remember people were going to the dolphin show so happy in hordes that, oh my God, there's finally something new in Lahore to do. I don't know how many of you know, all those dolphins, they're dead. It's been, what, it took them two years and they all died because animals do not survive in captivity. Um, one of the famous cases that we usually do talk about is Kavan. I don't know, uh, do you guys know about him? He's the elephant from Islamabad. So he was documented um, about five, six years ago, maybe maybe even 
no, I think this was about eight years ago. So somebody went to Islamabad Zoo and they saw this lonely elephant standing there who was just moving his trunk left and right, left and right. And when they asked his caretaker, why is he doing that? He said, Ke, oh, he's happy to see you. So, you know, he's swaying because he's so joyous. And but then that person there, she was a vet herself who was working in America. Um, and she knows that that's not what this is. Uh, the elephant, he was displaying signs of repression, which usually happens to captivated animals. And uh, this was him actually trying to soothe himself because he was so miserable. He had been alone for all these years. You know, elephants, they are they're family oriented. Just how we live in our joint families, they love living in joint families. They've got grandmas taking care of the kids. That's how they survive. But over here, you've got them, one elephant, ek aapka concrete sa wo hota hai, jis mein aapne ek elephant rakha hota hai. And elephants are not even meant to walk on that, which is why you see that um, even if you see Karachi wale elephant, ka dekhenge, who's still over there, I think she's called Rosie, if I'm not wrong. So her, her, you know, her paws are like they're bleeding, but there's nothing anyone can do about it. See, she's not supposed to be on that surface. So after all these years, um, Kavan has actually made it out. He is in a sanctuary in Cambodia. It took international organizations. It took Sher to come to Pakistan and protest go to the zoo, literally talk to the government to get that elephant out because nobody wanted to let go of him because they could not understand they were not willing to make a sanctuary, they were not willing to do anything for him because at the end of the day we don't want to give them a better life. We don't think they're just animals. So th th these are things that we were looking at and you know animals Abhi, she was talking about how a lot of people did not show up over here because they perhaps do not think it. you've got people, I mean, what's happening in Thar right now, it's quite horrible. You've got people who don't have water, people are dying, kids are dying, but then you've got livestock who's dying as well, and a lot of it. You've got a lot of other animals dying as well. There are so few people who are talking about animals. You know, you've got so many animal rights NGOs who are standing up, um, sorry, human rights NGOs who are standing up and they're doing something for the humans out there. I'm sure all of you know a lot of them and you're donating to them. How many animal rights NGOs do you know? So there are, yeah, there you go. There are two of them or three of them. In the entire Pakistan, there might be perhaps four or five registered animal rescue NGOs. And then the number of animals, it's incredible. Like five NGOs cannot take care of them. So the reason why we're doing this, the reason why we're here, is because there's so few out there who's doing anything for them. Somebody has to go out and say, hey, this is wrong. When we see humans being tortured, when we see humans being raped, being killed, we all agree that this is wrong and there, this should be stopped. So why is it then when the same thing happens to animals, when you see a dog who's stoned, who's beaten, we're suddenly okay with that. We really don't care because, hey, no, let's focus on the humans. But why can't we focus on both the issues? And the most important bit is perhaps that, you know, both these things are linked. If you're ignoring what's happening to the animals today, the same people who are harming these animals, they're going to come and they're going to harm us. There's a huge link between people who harm animals and then people who harm humans because usually they're psychopaths. And you know, a lot of times this starts at a very young age. We have had cases where there were kids who had mercilessly beaten kittens and puppies to death. Um, I guess this was one of the first cases we had which literally shocked us and it was near my house. So one of the neighbors actually came and they bought a small kitten to us, which we took and then we found out what story kya thi. So they were like five kittens maybe and a neighborhood child got hold of them. He was perhaps eight years old, seven, eight years old. So he took a bag and he put them in the bag and he just jumped on them. And then he took his bike, which is bicycle hoti hai, and he was on the bike and in the end only one survived. Now, do you think what that kid is doing is normal? And the entire time this neighbor was witnessing and she asked that kid to stop. The mother was there or the mother just said, Oh, bitta na karo. Oh, bitta hai mar jayenge. Oh, ho, ho. Achha, chalo, ye ho gaya. And then she just took the kid inside. 
there was no concern for what he's done to those kittens that behavior is not normal that kid should actually be taken to a psychologist and he should get some sort of therapy because this is wrong and i mean when you look at terrorists when you look at rapists if you look if you you know study psychology if you look back at it these are the people who are doing this they started somewhere and they started with the animals who could not tell anybody because they're the easiest targets all psychopaths that's what they do right 